Guys, gals, can I get your attention for just a second? This is a... Uh, Uh, thanks for being here. This is more just a technical thing. Um, Mr. Golish is going to do the introduction. Um, we've got a bunch of cameras moving around. We also have a new sound thing here. So if you're sitting, especially in this area, be very careful about the noises you're making and the talking you're making. I know that's not been a problem in the past. Um, we've got about 25 minute right presentation um, and a little thank you at the end. So that's kind of what our agenda is for today. Mr. Simons, is your crew ready to go? We're good. Okay. So Golik will start us in about a minute. We'll start filming. Sound good? Yeah. All right. Very good. our presentation today because I did the last presentation. This is going to be our third full iteration of our idea series. Before we move on, I just want to take a second to thank anybody that has been involved in this. This really is something that we want to be student driven and I'm really inspired by these two gentlemen that took the leap all right, to be the first ones today. I'd also like to thank anybody on the production team that's filming and the people that have worked on the graphics. The idea logo was designed by a student, Jenny Larson, and of course we just want to recognize everybody that's been involved. So let's give everybody a quick round of applause. <laughs> if you were interested in any of the previous presentations, they can be found on the WHS IDEA website. Or you can also go onto YouTube and check them out. Please do so. They've been very exciting and informative. And if this one is something that really if you were excited about, please tell a friend and have them go check it out afterwards. Okay. Without any further ado, I hope that this will inspire some of you to take that leap as well. If you're interested in doing a presentation, please talk to one of the adults in the room. And with that being said, let's give a warm welcome to Jesse and Tyler. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. 
need simple parameters. It can be it can be anything from the simplest of textures to the most complex things you could possibly imagine. <coughs> so the first aspect of music and kind of what we can manipulate to change it is complexity. And so um, for our purposes today, we have a scale that um, goes from simple to complex. The least complex or most simple is a sine wave. And then the most complex is white noise. And then within within those two bounds is where we can find the magic. So as we begin to talk about heat wave theory a little bit, as you mentioned, the sine wave is the most simple sound available. It's just a pure sound wave. You know, it doesn't really sound musical to us because it's, there's not enough going on to excite our ears. Where white noise is an entirely random generation of sound with equal probability of occurring at any frequency. So that, on the other end of the spectrum, is too complex and random for us to appreciate as musical. So then, as we start to move in between those, uh, something that is still sonically very simple, but we might start to recognize as music, is perhaps that same sine wave, instead of just playing one note, playing an entire melody.
so we can see within the scale there's sort of a horseshoe effect where the sine wave being the most simple and the white noise being the most complex sort of <coughs> are both not really nice. We don't like listening to them. They're not really pleasing to our ears and we don't really consider them music. And it's in the middle, in between these two extremes, this kind of golden area where we find music. It's in the natural, organic sounds that we produce as humans that we find pleasing to our ears. And that's sort of the first aspect that we think ties music to being human. So moving forward from there, we can start to talk about tuning, which is a very human debate because there are two main points of view on the topic. There are two real schools of thought with how we can tune instruments and how music should be tuned. So there is the equal temperament standard, which is what we've used for the past couple generations of music. Uh, it's based on formulas and how certain notes relate to each other. So if you've ever used like, an electronic tuner for an instrument or anything like that, it's based off of this standard. Uh, pretty much all the pop music you hear is also based off this, uh, because you know softwares like Auto-Tune are included deep in this. Uh, but then there is a standard that was used for all of human history before that, which is called just intonation, just meaning like correct, not like only. Uh, and this is, to put it simply, is just hearing things that are right, rather than trying to overthink it and use math. So this system is based entirely off of how we hear, uh, because as you're about to see, the way that formulas work out is not always the way that we hear. So I'm gonna play you a chord that is tuned with equal temperament standard. So to those of you who are musically trained, that might not sound like offensively out of tune, but I think when we compare it to one that is tuned using just intonation, you'll notice a little bit of a difference. So this one is tuned with just intonation. You might notice that it sounds a little bit fuller, uh, but compared to the first one, if you listen closely, you can hear a little bit of a wobble, kind of a wah, 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 which is the sound of the waves not perfectly lining up and speaking together. And I think that's especially strong if you play them together. Thank you. 
explanation for it, but we know that we want that resolution just like in regular everyday life. So there are a couple of theories of, of the emotional perception of music that we're going to talk about. The first one is the culturally learned perception of tonality, which suggests that happy or sad is learned through the cultures and societies that we live in, which would mean that there could be cultural exclusivity, which could mean like if we live here in America, in Oregon, we can learn one thing, but then someone who lives in Peru and South America or Iraq in the Middle East, they could have something that's totally different. And so that, that kind of implies that we, we only think that the first piece was happy because we're used to hearing happy piece in key in major keys, we're used to hearing sad piece in key in minor keys. So this kind of suggests that there's not any necessarily instinctual reason why. So this was investigated by a doctor named Thomas Tripp. Uh, he is an Austrian music researcher. So we have a little video from his study. In autumn 2005, Fritz traveled to a remote mountainous region in Cameroon to find out whether Western music can be understood by people who had only heard their own music up to then. I traveled to the Mandara Mountains because I was looking for people who had never heard Western music. To take part in the experiment, you should never have visited a church in your life. You should have lived a very traditional lifestyle. You should have never have listened to the radio. Harder was among those who took part. He plays a key role in all the Muffer's flute rituals. During German colonial rule, he collected taxes from the villages. And he's believed to be 110 years old. In the experiment, the researcher played harder and more than 50 other participants piano pieces associated with certain emotions in Western culture. Is harder able to hear these emotions and describe them? An example for joy. I'm an example for sadness. He was asked to point to the faces that best matched the sounds that he heard. That wasn't a problem for him, and he mostly pointed to the right faces. Despite all cultural differences, emotional expression in music appears to be globally understood. The reason could be rooted in the musical properties common to all languages. In der Melodieführung der Sprache, was für Pausen wir So, that effectively suggests that there is some instinct at work that no matter, no matter where you grew up and no matter what you've heard in the past, there is like a reason that is inside of us for how we hear sad and happy melodies. So then we can move on to another theory that kind of tries to explain this instinct. So the dissonance theory is basically a concept uh, that says because the notes we have are these ratios in between each other and how they line up. Uh, the ones that do not have easy ratios, like you know a two to one frequency or things like that, they don't sound as nice to us uh, because the math isn't as nice. This might sound a little bit weird, um, but it's basically saying that the the ratios that don't work out mathematically is going to be don't sound as pretty and happy to us. Uh, however, there are a couple reasons that this is not the most likely because there are several very dissonant intervals that can sound happy in context. So for instance, the tritone. Uh, it was known classically as the devil's interval, and then it's celebrably that it's used in European police sirens and everything because it sounds so unnatural and jarring. <laughs> uh, even that, when played in the context of a dominant seven chord, can sound happy. We get the tritone alone, and if we add the rest of the chord. says that when we are sad, we use melodies 
not just classically trained actors, and they have them say phrases like, come here, go away, and they ask them to say them happily and sadly and angrily and things like that. And the ones that were associated with more negative emotions tended to be said with uh, speech patterns that kind of mirrored minor scales, and you know, they all fit with happy phrases. Um, so that actually suggests that we don't, the emotion doesn't come from the scale. The emotion already existed inside of us in the way that we speak. And the scales are just built to reconstruct that in music. <laughs> so at this point, you're probably sitting here going, okay, we got these two music nerds in front of us <laughs> showing us some cool little tricks, but why, is, why did we come here to this lecture hall? Why are we here listening to them give this presentation? And what does it have to do with idea? And so we uh, set out with this presentation to look at humanity and music. Uh, we talked in the beginning about the tempo and how the heartbeat related to um, the tempo and how just by changing that we could already manipulate the way that you felt. We talked about how complexity has that sweet spot between simple and intricate that is where we find music. It's in the organic, non-computerized sounds that we can make and create and use to make music that that's what we like to hear. Uh, we talked about how we tune by our ears and not by the numbers. We heard how much more resonant and full that um, the one chord was as opposed to the one that was um, used to tune computers, or tune used com anyways. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, we just finished talking about how harmony is instinctual and how about no matter, no matter where it, they were in the world, everyone kind of perceived harmony in the same way, and which kind of ties everything together in that we really were interested in looking at the universality and the humanness within music and how regardless of where you are, whether you live on this side of the earth, the other side of the earth, whether what language you speak, what religion you're a part of, what the color of your skin is, music unites us and brings us together. And we are able to use music to express the ideas and emotions and feelings that we have across all those boundaries. And that brings us together and that's inside of us. And we think that it's absolutely beautiful that we're able to use that and be united as humans, which is why we'd like to end our presentation by saying that. Music is human. Thank you.